So I hope uh, you guys will all ask questions during the talk. Okay, I'm gonna try to make it as pedagogical as I can. And uh, I have to warn you that sometimes if I don't get enough questions from the audience, I start picking out particular people and uh, asking them questions, you know? For example, I might say the person in the purple shirt, you know, and, and, and you'll have to answer. I'm not gonna ask Sam. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, please ask lots of questions. All right. Descent on what? Of course, they cannot answer. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> they can choose not to answer. You have the right to remain silent. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, here's the plan of my talk. So, what I'm going to talk about is first the classical Hall effect. And then I'm gonna talk about the phenomenology of the quantum Hall effect. Now, please tell me if I'm writing big enough that it can be seen from the back. And if I'm speaking loud enough, usually the loudness is not a problem. Actually, it's a problem, but it's a problem the other way. But um, anyway, so, so if you cannot hear me, then, then please uh, tell me. Okay, so I'll tell you what the phenomena are, what is, what is surprising about these phenomena, and then we will talk about Landau levels. And then we'll talk a little bit about edges. These are very important, especially for this particular conference because a lot of the platforms that are based on quantum hall systems for quantum information processing are based on edge modes of quantum hall systems. And so we'll talk a little bit about edges and this, will, this entire lecture will be about the integer quantum Hall effect. The next lecture will be about the fractional quantum Hall effect from two different perspectives, wave function perspective in the first half, and then um, the Chun Simons perspective of whom the originator is sitting right here. So if you have any questions, don't ask me, ask Eduardo. And uh, the third one, <laughs> and then the third lecture will be about actual Sun Simons theory itself without involving any fermions, effective theory of abelian quantum Hall states. And then Eduardo will continue with non-abelian quantum Hall states, which are actually more interesting and more useful for quantum computation. So, the, and then finally, no discussion of the quantum Hall effect is complete without talking about disorder. So I'm gonna tell you, this is the only time I'll really be talking about disorder. And this is only the, like the end of the first lecture, but you have to know that disorder is extremely important. Without disorder, there is no quantized Hall effect. Okay, we'll talk about that. All right, so let's begin. So the classical Hall effect was actually discovered, Hall effect was discovered in something like 1879 or something like that you know, more than a hundred years ago. And this was somebody called Edmund Hall or Edwin Hall or something like that. And a very simple experiment. You just take a two dimensional metallic sheet. You put some perpendicular magnetic field through it. Let's call it B, right? And then you drive a current in that direction. And then you ask yourself, if I measure the voltages of different kinds, what do I measure? Okay, so there are two kinds of voltages I can, I can use. So typically what happens is that you have some contact here. This contact is called the source, S. There's another contact here that's called the drain. And then there's a bunch of other contacts that you will use to actually measure voltages. Okay, so these are two contacts along this edge. There are two other contacts along that edge. And this voltage here is known as the longitudinal voltage. Okay, this is what would measure the normal resistance, the usual kind of resistance that you measure in a wire in your lab would be measured by this longitudinal resistance. And then there's something else which you can call the transverse resistance or in this particular field it's called the Hall resistance or the Hall voltage. And uh, the, the Hall voltage divided by the current that you put in here, this is the current is known as the Hall resistance. And that is what we will be talking about. And that is what, that is one of the quantities whose behavior is very surprising in the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so um, how does this go classically? Let's ask. 
It depends a little bit upon whether the charge carriers are electrons or holes. You probably all know that in solid state physics, you can have either the carriers being electrons or the carriers being holes. So let's think about the carriers first being electrons. So let's say these are electrons, okay? And then the electrons, you turn on the, the current, the electrons, the current is this way. So the electrons are obviously moving that way, right? So you know that the current density, this is going to be the X component of the current density, right? It's going to be equal to the number density of charges times the charge times the drift velocity, all right? This is like the standard formula for the current density. All I want to remind you of here is that we are working in two dimensions. So this is a number per unit area, okay? And this current density is the current per unit length. This is all in two dimensions. Okay, great. So the current itself, the current that you're driving is going to look like, so let me put some dimensions here. So this side is Ly. We will not need the other side, but let me put it anyway. So that is Lx, okay? So the current itself is going to be equal to Jx times Ly, right? And that will be minus N E V X times L Y. I did something bad here. I should have put a vector. Okay. So uh, there's that. So from that, you can figure out what is the drift velocity of these electrons. Okay? The drift velocity of these electrons is going to look like minus I X over N E L Y. Okay, so these electrons are, they start out moving in the negative X direction. Then, so this is the velocity of the electron. And of course, there's a Lorentz force. There's a perpendicular magnetic field. So there's a Lorentz force. So the V cross B is coming out of the board. So it, the electron's charge is negative. So the force in the, is into. So these guys, these electrons start accelerating in the plus y direction and they start piling up against the edge okay because there's nowhere for them to go once they pile up what happens is that they create an electric field that's in that direction ey because it's like a parallel plate capacitor in some sense right so they create an electric field and this electric field will build up and build up until such time as the force of this electric field exactly cancels the Lorentz force of the magnetic field that's trying to bend the electron up in Y. Okay, is this clear? In your undergraduate, this is known sometimes as the velocity selector. Yeah. This experiment was done at room temperature in, in 1881. And uh, this experiment can be done at any temperature. Okay, in those days, maybe the magnetic fields they had were just maybe a fraction of a Tesla, or, or maybe they had electromagnets that could make a Tesla or two Teslas. Nowadays, we can go up to 40, 50 Tesla, and we can go down to, you know, milli okay? But this is all I'm talking about the classical model. Okay, so therefore, what you want in the steady state is that this EY, should be equal to Vx times B, Vz, right? Because Qe should be equal to Qvb, right? That's what should happen in order for the, the, the electric force to cancel the Lorentz magnetic force. And therefore this in the steady state, so let me just talk about the magnitudes here of all these guys, right? And the voltage, the Hall voltage is simply going to be Ey times Ly, right? Again, the voltage is simply E times the distance in the Y direction. If you don't follow it, please stop me, okay? I do have a tendency to talk a little fast. So if you find that I'm going too fast, stop me and ask me to go over something. Let me also remind you that there is a tutorial session. I'm gonna give you, Guru Prasad has already given you some homework. I'm gonna give you some more homework. It's all fairly simple, but we will be there in the evening between 6.30 and 7.30. Do we have the room here, Sumati? Okay, 
So we'll be here and we'll be here to answer questions. But really what we want is for you guys to, to do it, to solve it, okay? Okay, any questions so far? None, all right. So this is going to be equal to, so now let me just borrow all those things over there. So this is Vx times B times Ly, and that is going to be equal to, um, what is it? Ix uh, over N E L Y times, uh, sorry, times B L Y. And you can see that this cancels, okay? So this quantity, very important quantity, known as the Hall resistance, is simply equal to B over N E. I'm using MKS units. Sometimes in the literature, you'll see CGS units being used. And so there'll be a C at the, at the bottom of that, but let's stick to MKS units here, okay? So the situation is you have this, this sheet with some constant number density per unit area, and then you vary the magnetic field and you ask yourself, what does the Hall resistance look like as a function of magnetic field? And what you will find is something that looks like that. This is the Hall resistance and this is the magnetic field. The slope of this guy tells you the number density. So in fact, in a lot of condensed matter labs, when you first make a material, you dope it. This is one way to find out what is the density of charge carriers, is to actually do a classical Hall measurement and look at the slope. That tells you one over N. In fact, the homework, so let me say, Homework, show that if holes are the charge carriers, then the hall is reversed. So the sign changes, it's very easy to show. So go ahead and show it. And uh, if you have trouble, then, then come to the, well, anyway, come to the tutorial anyway, because even if you don't have a question, somebody else will have a question and that may help you to understand other stuff. Okay, so this is uh, what is observed at room temperature. Okay, very good. So that was the classical Hall effect. What about the quantum Hall effect? The quantum Hall effect is the following observation that if you reduce the temperature, you make these systems really, really clean, okay, and you reduce the temperature to, let's say a fraction of a Kelvin, you make the magnetic field really large, then what you start seeing is a deviation. So at high temperatures, this is indeed what the Hall resistance looks like as a function of magnetic field. But as you reduce the temperature, if your system is good enough, then you will start seeing some stuff that looks like this, okay? And you know, th there's a picture, there's a very nice picture that I copied from uh, the Nobel press release for 1998. And uh, it, it, it shows many, many more different, these, these regions here are called plateaus. And so basically what happens is that the Hall resistance starts looking like this, okay? Seems to remain constant for some range of B, and then it changes to something else and remains constant for some other range of B and so on and so on. And these values over here are not random values. They are very special values. So one of the important values is H over E squared. You can convince yourself that if you take H, Planck's constant and E the charge of the electron, then H over E squared is actually resistance. Okay, this is a interesting fact. Then this guy will be H over two E squared. There's something here. There's something at H over three E squared. And in fact, if you go even higher, there are also some rational, you know, some, some, some multiples of H over E squared, okay? And we'll talk about in the, it, that in the next lecture. That corresponds to the fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay, so this is the phenomenon. There's another thing that goes hand in hand with this. So this was the Hall resistance. H over E squared is not the maximum. In fact, 
if you go way up here, there's, there's actually a 3H over E squared as well, which is a very prominent plateau. And we'll be talking about that in the, in the next lecture. That corresponds to the fractional quantum Hall effect. So let me mark this in orange. This is the Hall resistance. And then there is also the longitudinal resistance. And that would simply be, let me define it here, Rxx is V longitudinal over Ix. Okay, and this is V longitudinal right here. Okay, that is also measured. And what you find at these very low temperatures, very high magnetic fields, is that this Hall, this, sorry, the longitudinal resistance seems to vanish whenever the Hall resistance is on a plateau and whenever the Hall resistance is changing, the longitudinal resistance shows peaks. Okay, so these are the phenomena that go by the name of the quantum Hall effect. You mean in order to make it quantum? Yeah. So one thing you have to do is go to very low temperatures. Okay. Another thing you have to do is make your system clean enough. Okay. If you have a very dirty system, then you don't see anything because the whole system gets localized. There's no transport. You have to make the system clean enough. You have to make the temperature low enough. You have to make the magnetic field high enough. So a couple of Tesla, a few Tesla, okay? These densities we are talking about here, the number densities are between 10 to the 10 per centimeter square. They use these funny units. And let's say 10 to the 12 per centimeter square. Okay, those are the typical densities that are used in, in one, very common material that has been studied a lot. And this material is called gallium arsenide. There's some complicated technique for making heterostructures of these things so that there are two dimensional sheets of electrons. And there's a lot of technology that goes into this. That's why it was discovered only in 1980. Okay? It took a long time to, to develop these materials and then people stumbled upon it. So there was you know, this famous paper by von Klitzing Dorda and Pepper. Nineteen eighty, and they got the Nobel Prize. And I think von Klitzing also got the Nobel Prize for it in nineteen eighty-five. And this was the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay, so this is the the phenomenon. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You, you will see, okay? You will see in due course of time what it is. You're right, it, it, there is, there is some, some, some energy scale that you have to go below in order to see the quantum Hall effect. Yeah. Well, as far as steady fields are concerned, I think people have gone up to 35, 40 Tesla. Now, if you, if you want temporary fields, okay, there's some kind of an explosive uh, device Okay, where you destroy the sample, but then for some fraction of a second, you take data while you're, you know, and you can ramp up the fields to, I believe, like of the order of 100 Tesla. The peaks here depend upon the amount of disorder in the sample, they depend on the temperature, they depend on many things. Okay, so what is universal in, in every sample is the fact that there are these plateaus, the fact that these plateaus are at quantized values, okay, of h over e squared, some rational multiple of h over e squared. And whenever the Rxy or R, R Hall, Hall resistance is on a plateau, the Rxx is zero. And as you reduce the temperature, the quantization of this guy, how close it appears to, to, to h over e squared or rational multiple becomes better and better. In fact, this is now the, the, the standard, the resistance standard is a quantum Hall resistance. Okay. The fine structure constant, exactly. Yeah. Or any optics or any atomic measurement. Other questions? Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. No, 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 no. 
No, no, no. The distances are not the same. No, absolutely not. There are a lot of plateaus crowded in here that I'm not showing you. If you look in the picture that I have in the notes, okay, uh, you will see many more peaks and, and many more plateaus of RXY. This picture is actually a lot more complicated than I'm making it out to be. In between these two, there are other plateaus that I'm not able to draw for you because my drawing is not good enough. As you raise the temperature, very good. So as you raise the temperature, let me draw a, uh, if I raise the temperature, so this is at some temperature, let us say some very low temperature, let's say a few millikelvin. If I raise the temperature, then what's gonna happen is that this plateau is gonna become something like that. These plateaus are gonna become very small. Okay, they're, they're gonna become less broad. And uh, these peaks are gonna become more, so this RXX will not touch zero. Instead, it will just oscillate, maybe never touching zero. It will tend to more and more towards the straight line that you see at high temperature, okay? So the white straight line is what you see at high temperature in any sample that's metallic. So it will go towards that as you raise the temperature. Other questions? Yes. The thermal transport also has been done very recently. We will talk about that later. There is some, some, some quantized thermal transport also that happens. We will not talk a lot about it, but, but if you ask me at that point, okay? Yes. That is, a, that is a very interesting question. We don't actually know what, what happens. It depends upon the, the degree of disorder in the system. So in between these integer plateaus, there are other fractional plateaus that occur, okay? And so especially between, let us say this guy and that guy, there are several fractional plateaus. So if the system is very clean, then you'll see a lot of fractional plateaus between the two integer plateaus. Okay, but yes, eventually you expect to see a bunch of steps of different heights and different widths. Okay. Other questions? Okay, this is good. There are lots and lots of questions. Yes. Yeah. Which one? Right, 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 right. So all I'm saying is that because of the Lorentz force, when I switch on the current, the electrons are accelerated that way. Yes, they go there, but when they go there, they also set up an electric field. At some point, this, the electric field force will counterbalance the Lorentz force and the electrons will move straight and then no more charge will pile up there, okay? So when I say localized, no, they're not localized. These charges may be moving, they may not be moving. But the, there is some excess negative charge here and there's some excess positive charge. Okay. Good. All right. So now let's get to the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so this, it turns out, even though it appears very strange, this phenomenon, you know, not counting this other stuff that I'm telling you about at three H over E squared and so on, this phenomenon was understood within two or three years of its discovery. Okay? And so let's understand what it is. So first of all, you know, just from the fact that the H appears, Planck's constant appears, that this must have something to do with quantum mechanics. So we start with our basic quantum mechanics and we say, you know, what is the quantum mechanics of electrons moving in a plane subject to a perpendicular magnetic field, right? So we wanna set up the quantum mechanics of that. And the simplest level, what we want to do is non-interacting electrons. And a lot of it, the integer quantum Hall effect, can be understood by thinking about non-interacting electrons. So let's do that first, and then we'll turn on the interactions, and then we'll see what extra stuff they bring out. Okay. So you probably all know that when I do something, so when you do quantum mechanics, 
you have to do it in the Hamiltonian formalism, right? And uh, when you do even classical mechanics in the Hamiltonian formalism, if you're talking about charged particles, they don't talk directly to the electric and magnetic fields. In fact, they talk to the vector and the scalar potentials, right? That's how in the Hamiltonian formalism, you couple charged particles to electromagnetic fields. So how does it work? So there is a vector potential, there's a scalar potential, they're connected to the electric and magnetic fields by these relations. Again, I'm using MKS, okay? And B is simply the curl of A. And given this, the way that the Hamiltonian is written down, so let me first write down the classical Hamiltonian. So if I have a particle of charge Q, then I will write down the Hamiltonian as P minus Q times A plus Q times phi. This will be my classical Hamiltonian. And the way that the coordinates of the particle appear inside here are in these things here. So there's some X and T squared. This X is the coordinate of the particle itself. That is how X, so the Hamiltonian should be a function of X and T. That's how X appears here. And then of course, in the scalar potential also, it may appear, okay? So that is what the Hamiltonian of a charged particle looks like, okay? So now we are gonna take an electron, so it's minus E. And to make my own life simple, okay, I'm gonna choose the magnetic field to be pointing along the negative Z axis, okay? Because it'll, it'll make something simple for me eventually, okay? All right, so I have this, and now there is no electric field at the moment. I'm taking the simplest possible situation where there's only simply a magnetic field, and so therefore I don't need a scalar potential. So let me set phi equal to zero, and this B is a constant. There's no time dependence. So I get some time independent Hamiltonian. Now there's one thing that you have to worry about whenever you talk about quantum mechanics or even classical mechanics of electromagnetic or of charged particles, which is gauge transformations. So you know that E and B don't uniquely specify A and phi, right? You can always make a gauge transformation and it, it will look something like this. You take some, so you take some, some A nu, let's say, and this would be some A plus the gradient of some smooth scalar, some function of space and time perhaps, okay? At the same time, if you let phi go to phi minus d chi by dt, then E and B remain unchanged and therefore the physics should remain unchanged. So when you solve for the quantum mechanics or even the classical mechanics of a charged particle, you have to pick a gauge in which to do business. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna take a rectangular sample first. So let me take a rectangular sample. I'm gonna do some more stuff to it in a minute, but let's start with the rectangular sample. So I have LX and I have LY. And for this particular geometry of sample, the most convenient gauge is something known as Landau gauge. So I'm gonna choose Landau gauge and my Landau gauge will look like A is minus B X E Y, okay? And you can easily convince yourself that the curl of A is in fact this minus B in the Z direction, okay? So that'll be my vector potential. And now let me write down my quantum Hamiltonian, okay? So my quantum Hamiltonian will look like this. So whenever I write an operator, I'm gonna put a double line on one side of it to indicate that it's an operator, okay? Because often we'll have operators, we'll have eigenvalues, we'll have numbers, and to distinguish between them, I'll put that double line there. So this means it's an operator. And so it will look something like one over two M. So there is a PX squared because there's no vector potential for that, right? And then there will be a PY minus E, B, X. Of course, X is now an operator as well. 
And that is why I chose the magnetic field to be in the negative Z direction because I wanted to cancel the negative sign of the electrons charge. Okay. So, all right, so this is what I have. And now I want to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. I want to find all the eigenvalues. I want to find the eigenstates and then, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so this Hamiltonian, you can see immediately by inspection that it commutes with py. So therefore, I can simultaneously diagonalize py and the Hamiltonian. In order to do that though, I have to make sure that py itself is a good prime number, right? So what I do for that is I put periodic boundary conditions. So let me say p, b, c over here. So you imagine rolling this guy up into a tube, okay? So there's periodic boundary conditions in the y direction. So py is a good prime number. And you have the eigenstates of py are simply plane waves. I've even normalized it, okay? So these are the eigens. All right, so now I'll have to solve some differential equation, but fortunately it's a differential equation that I already know from, from many, many years ago. And uh, so let me write down what that differential equation looks like. So now my Hamiltonian acting upon my psi of X and Y is going to look like one over two M and there's of course a minus h bar squared, d squared dx squared, right? There's that. And then, so, so let me say my psi n k is going to be equal to e to the i k x over square root l y times some phi n k of x alone. Okay, this particular geometry, I can factorize the wave function like this. And uh, what it looks like, is of course there's a plus minus i h bar d by dy minus e b x acting on e to the i k y sorry this is a y square root l y y n k of x okay that's what it looks like and i want to solve this i want to find all the eigenstates i want to say This is the equation I want to solve, okay? I've already put in the fact that PY is a good quantum number. So I, I, I plug that in and then I got a differential equation for phi of X. So I find one over two M minus H bar squared D squared by DX squared now, because it's only acting on one variable. And then there is plus H bar K minus EBX squared y n k x is e n k y n k of x. Okay, so this is the this is the equation I want. This equation is simply the harmonic oscillator in disguise, because all you have to do is you have to shift x by something. Okay, and then once you shift it, it looks like x squared. And uh, there is a d d squared by d x squared, and there's an x squared. That's simply the harmonic oscillator. That's all it is. So in order to do that shifting, let me go over there. Let me go over here and define something known as the magnetic plane. This is a very important length scale whenever you have an orbital magnetic field. Okay, this defines for you, the, this sort of defines for you the length scale over which you get one flux quantity. Okay, so there are many ways of thinking about this, okay, but one way to think about it is that two pi L squared is the area for one flux quantum. Okay, what is one flux quantum? A flux quantum is phi naught is H over E in MKS units. 
what is this guy here? Anybody know what a flux quantum is? Up there in the back benches? Okay, superconducting ring would have half of that flux. Okay, but why? Why is this called the flux quantum? Is flux quantized? No, only in a superconductor is quantized. In general, it's not quantized, right? So why is this called a flux quantum? This was notation, I believe, introduced by Dirac because he was trying to find a monopole. So he was thinking about the monopole as one end of some very long, very thin solenoid. And he said, if there's a monopole here, then I have some string and then there's an anti-monopole somewhere else. But in order to really be a monopole, I should not be able to detect this string. When can I not detect a string? Well, supposing I make a loop around this thing, I take an electron in a loop around it and I ask how much phase does the electron accumulate? There's an Arano Bohm phase, which is I E over H bar, the integral of A dot DL. You guys know about this? How many people have seen this before? How many people have never seen this before? The Aharono Bohm phase. Okay, you've seen it now. Okay, so whenever you take an electron around some magnetic flux, this is the amount of flux that it accumulates. Okay, so Dirac said, all right, if I should not be able to detect this solenoid, then this should be e to the i h bar e. This is this flux, this is the flux quantum that I'm talking about, should be this, this number should be two pi. Okay, because e to the i two pi is one and the electron doesn't know whether it's there or not. Okay, and then it appears as though this monopole and the anti-monopole are completely separate objects because nobody can tell that there's this thin solenoid. This is not the way we think about monopoles nowadays, but this is the way Dirac thought about it in those days. Okay, so that's where this flux quantum comes from. Okay, so now, so that two pi L squared is the area which encloses one flux quantum. And now let's put that in there, this length scale L. And what we're gonna do is de-dimensionalize everything, okay? And now I can go through it. So anytime people think that I'm going too fast, please tell me, okay? And I will slow down and I'll, I'll explain the steps to you. Uh, but really think of this as, each of these little steps, if I skip over a little step, think of it as your homework, okay? And, and, and just try to fill in all the steps. So I'm gonna write down the Hamiltonian now, and it's gonna look like this. So it's gonna look like h bar squared over two m l squared, okay? It's gonna look like minus l squared d squared by dx squared plus one over L squared X minus A L squared squared, okay? And that on phi N K of X is E N K phi N K of X. So I've, I've sort of factored things out. I've put things back, something, something, okay? But really this thing is now dimensionless. Okay, the operator sitting inside the curly braces is dimensionless. Okay, just go home and verify that this is all correct. So this guy here, if I put in this L squared is, you know, H bar over EB, this one looks like EB over 2M, which is simply the cyclotron frequency, H bar times the cyclotron frequency divided by two. Okay. That's what it looks like. And now this is simply the harmonic oscillator shifted to this origin. And the energy of course, doesn't depend on the choice of origin. And so therefore the energy will only depend upon N. The eigenvalues of this are simply N plus a half, right? This particular operator here in the curly braces, eigenvalues are N plus a half. And so this, is uh, I guess it's two n plus one here because there's a half sitting outside. So you get E n k 
is n plus one half h bar omega c. Okay, and it's independent of k. All right. Questions. What conditions do we have on K? Very good. So if I want my, my boundary conditions to be periodic, okay? So let me do the simplest thing and let me say that I'm going to impose psi of X, Y plus LY is psi of X and Y, okay? Suppose I impose periodic boundary conditions. Then the value of K is going to be given by two pi j over ly and we're going to come to that in a minute sorry there is no boundary condition in the expression i'm not specifying anything uh, yes and no <laughs> you'll you'll see <laughs> okay i mean i i can i can actually put some some hard wall boundary condition i'd rather not I will in, in a few minutes when I talk about edges. But at the moment, I'm talking about the bulk, so I would rather not specify what happens on, in the X direction. I, I will soon, okay? Hmm? There, there, there will be something shortly, okay? All right? Just wait for it. Other questions? Very good. Okay, that's another very good question. So as usual, what we theorists do is we try to solve problems we can solve, right? So we solve this and then we say, okay, what do interactions do to this? And now you're asking, what is the strength of the interactions compared to something else, right? That's really what you're asking. Now that depends a lot on what is the density of electrons compared to the magnetic field. So that's why I'm not getting into it right now. Okay, if you have the right amount of density such that an integer number of these Landau levels, these by, guys, by the way, are called Landau levels. Okay, so this N starts from zero, one, two, and so on. And these are the Landau levels. I'm go also gonna call them simply LLs, okay? If you have the right density to fill up exactly an integer number of these Landau levels, then the interactions are not that important. If it's not the right number to fill up an integer number, if you have a fractional number, then they're extremely important. They're more important than anything else. It's related to the filling, actually. We'll come to that, okay? So yeah, these are all very good questions. They're anticipating something that will happen shortly. Okay, maybe not in this lecture, but in the in the next lecture. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Because we already know the eigenstate in the y direction. Very good. So the question was the, the, the first equation with this H with the double symbol, double double line was in two dimensions, but suddenly it became one dimensional equation. That's because I factorized it. This is what is, I think, mathematically called the separation of variables or something. In this geometry, I can separate out the Y component of the wave function from the X component. With the degeneracy, it will, it will, it will shortly. So this, this geometry is very nice because you can do everything, okay, analytically. Other questions? Okay, so let's carry on. So now, these guys don't depend upon K, right? So there is a lot of degeneracy. So how much is the degeneracy? So let's compute it. Again, this geometry is very nice for computing what the degeneracy of, the, of each Landau level is. And to do that, I'm gonna write it as a tube. I'm now gonna explicitly draw a tube and I'm gonna draw some, uh, 
So let me let me gather some key facts. So we know from the bottom of that very last rightmost panel that k is quantized because of periodic boundary conditions in the y direction. Okay, this this putting a finite length actually helps me count because everything becomes finite. So that is those are the values of k. For every value of k, there is something that I can call x sub k which is the, called the guiding center. Okay, this is a word that you will, you will hear again. Guiding center of that particular orbit. And this is simply k sub j L squared. Okay, so this is the center around which this harmonic potential is, is, is being felt by the electron. Okay, so an electron with a wave number in the y direction of k will feel that it's confined to a region around capital X sub K. Okay, that's what it feels like to the electron. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw this, this tube. So here's my tube, right? The circumference of this tube is LY. And uh, the length of this tube is LX. And so I'm gonna draw these lines here, okay? these x sub k's. So well, there's some lines like this, okay? And so on and so on. What is the separation of two of these lines? The separation is simply between k sub j and k sub j plus one, right? And their separation is two pi over L y. So the smallest separation is simply two pi L squared over L y between two successive orbits. When I draw this line here, I don't intend to say that it's completely localized on this line. It spreads out, okay, around this line, but its greatest, you know, density is around that line. Of course, depending on which Landau level you're talking about, I can also write down the wave function. So let me write down these wave functions here as well. So there's a phi and k that looks something like, you know, one over, some stuff, okay? Some stuff here, some stuff there, and some more stuff here. Okay, these are the Hermit polynomials that you know about from your harmonic oscillator solution, okay? So that's what the wave function looks like, but it, it doesn't matter, okay? What the, the important thing is that it's spread out, you know, around the center which is this x sub j, okay? All right, but each of these guiding centers marks the location of a particular orbit. Okay, so now I ask myself, how many states are there? Now I say, okay, if I take some length Lx, so now I'm assuming that, that this is continuing, okay? Beyond my Lx, and this continues in the same old tube. I'm asking myself, how many states are there in this range of Lx. And the number of states will simply be, so this is the degeneracy, is Lx divided by delta x, right? And that is simply Lx, Ly over two pi L squared. I already told you that two pi L squared is the area that it takes to have one flux quantum at the particular field that we're talking about B, okay? So this, you can think about it as the number of flux quanta that go through the sample. And this is, we are gonna see this number again. So I'm gonna give it a name and I'm gonna call it N sub phi. Okay? So you can perhaps expand this and you can write it like this, B L X L Y over H over E make it completely explicit. This is the total flux going through the sample divided by phi naught. Okay, that's what it looks like. So that is the degeneracy. Yes, you are. Yeah. Excellent point. Excellent point. So what you are saying, is that this delta x is, goes down with Ly, 
Okay, so typically what you have in a, in a, in a sample that's of the size of microns, so let me give you some, some rough length scales. So if you have B approximately one Tesla, the magnetic length is about 25 nanometers. Okay, that's a very tiny length. And the higher you make the B, the smaller this length will shrink because it's h bar over EB square root, right? Okay, whereas the size of a sample LX and LY is of the order of 10 microns. Okay, that's typical size of a sample, maybe even bigger. So therefore, typically you will have this LX and LY much, much larger than little l. And so therefore, what's gonna happen is that this delta x is gonna be a very tiny length indeed. Okay, because it is L times the ratio of little l by capital Ly, which is a very small number. So these guys are extremely closely spaced. And if I draw the wave function itself of one of these guys, let's say this guy, then it will actually look like this. There'll be some Gaussian centered at this point. It is huge. It encompasses many, 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 many guiding centers. But nevertheless, they're all orthogonal because they have different wave numbers in the y direction. Okay, so this is y orthogonality. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian. I'm just drawing this part of it. If it's the lowest Landau level, then it's indeed a Gaussian. If it's n equals zero Landau level, it is a Gaussian. If it's a higher Landau level, it won't be a Gaussian. It'll be something else. Why am I saying what? Flatter? We just speak about the guiding center, but the width of this, this, this thing is of the order of the magnetic length. Just look at this Gaussian here. Okay, whereas the distance between these two is that much, which is much, much smaller than a magnetic plane. Okay. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> it's, it's not a big deal. They are, they are, they are overlapping a lot. Actually, there, there are some implications. So the point is that the, the, the fact that they overlap means that they sort of behave like itinerant electrons in terms of uh, their spin exchange properties, okay? So if you have localized spins, then if, if the wave function is completely localized, there's no overlap between wave functions, then the Coulomb exchange integral is very small, right? Whereas if they're heavily overlapping, then the exchange integral is very big, and this plays a role in, in some of the phenomena in, in uh, even in integer quantum Hall systems, in some cases. I cannot hear anything. Speak up. Hello? Yeah. yeah. So what if we consider the case where LX is less than LY? LX is less than LY. Uh, then it's a very weird case. I would say that, that uh, you know, a lot of the phenomena that you, that you expect for the bulk of a quantum Hall system will not be seen in such samples. Or you can think about situations where LX or LY become comparable to L, little l. Again, you will not see many of the phenomena. They will look very different. Okay? Yeah. Uh, in one Landau level, this many electrons per spin, right? So if there are two spins, we're talking about non-interacting electrons. So in a particular Landau level, you can fill up two times n sub five electron, okay, because up spin and down spin. At the moment, yeah. No, no, not just a possibility. There's definitely a coupling. There's a Zeeman coupling to the spin. We're not talking about that. Yeah, that's correct. And th there's a reason for that. The reason is that uh, the Zeeman coupling in this material, gallium arsenide, is actually very small. So compared to, let's say the cyclotron energy, which is H bar. So there, there, are, there are things that I'm not telling you. For example, this M here is not the mass of the electron in, in vacuum. It's the effective band mass of the electron inside gallium arsenide, which turns out to be very tiny compared to the mass of the electron. So this scale, this, this energy scale is much larger than it, what it would be in vacuum. 
at the same time, the Zeeman coupling, there's a G factor coming from the spin orbit coupling of gallium arsenide, which actually shrinks the, 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 the importance of the Zeeman. Okay, so the Zeeman energy is much, much smaller than the cyclotron energy. So that's why it's a, it's a reasonable approximation to think about the electrons as, you know, the, the, the Hamiltonian as being almost spin independent. I'm sorry, the degeneracy again. Okay, so what I'm saying is that each of these positions is this, okay? KL squared, K is quantized by the periodic boundary conditions. So each of these represents a state, okay? Now you ask how many states are there within a length of L sub X? Okay, that will be L sub X divided by the spacing between these guys. Sorry? For a given value of ky, there's only one orbital state. These are the choices for k. Okay, so if you take this tube to be from minus infinity to infinity, yes. Yes, but every one of these guys has a position in X. If I ask myself, what are the Landau orbits that lie within my L sub X? That's these guys. There are other guys lying outside here. They're all quantized by this, right? Yeah, J, J can be anything. You're right, J can be any integer. Most of those orbits will lie outside my sample. Okay, their wave functions will not have support inside my sample. You can also have many ends, but we're talking about a single end right now, I hope. Okay, was, was that the question? Was it N or? It was K. The question was about K, not N. Okay, yes. Other questions? Yeah. Very good. So if it has any component in the perpendicular direction, the perpendicular component will come into the orbital part of the Hamiltonian. The non-perpendicular, the parallel component will come into the Zeeman part of the Hamiltonian. There are other second order effects that it does in gallium arsenide because the, the field in the plane can somehow alter the wave function of the, of the two deg. But uh, let's, let's leave all that aside. That's complicated, complicated stuff. If you did what? No, there won't be. There will be a finite degeneracy. No, no, no. <laughs> because then it will be the same state, right? Because the case, even though you can, you can come back, they will start repeating themselves. Those states will no longer be orthogonal to each other. Let's talk about it offline, okay? So per Landau level, there is a finite degeneracy. It's equal to the area of the surface area of the torus divided by the number of flux quanta. Okay? You have, to, you have to make sure of a few things, like you have to make sure that the, the uh, that degeneracy is an integer. Okay, when you quantize it on a torus, you have to make sure of that. But given that, it's there's a finite degeneracy. Okay? Yes? Add disorder in this now? How do I add disorder? Um, I mean, adding disorder in a real system is very easy, right? You, you just put in some impurities and some potential and stuff like that. Okay? Sorry? I mean in the analysis. In the? In the, in the Hamiltonian, how do you model disorder? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay? You have to do it approximately. You can't do it exactly. Or you can, but it'll be heavily numerical. Oh, hey, this is great. Lots and lots of questions. So at least you guys are not sleeping. But I warn you that if somebody starts sleeping 
including you all here. I will call them out, okay? So, all right, great. So let's proceed. And now we're gonna talk. So what does the spectrum now look like? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw something known as the density of states. So this, this is the number of states per unit energy interval, okay? It's very commonly used in condensed matter for all kinds of materials. So let me plot that. So I will call it DOS, okay? So density of states, very good. So here is the energy and there in the, on the vertical axis is the density of states. So I'm gonna draw something that looks like that, something that looks like that. Whenever I draw a vertical line with an arrow like this, it means the delta function, okay? And the height of this arrow represents the degeneracy, the number of states that are contained in this delta function. Okay, delta function means it's just a particular energy. This particular energy is h bar omega c one over two. This particular energy is three by two h bar omega c one and so on. So this would be called the n equals zero Landau level of the red field. And this would be called the n equals one Landau level. This would be called the n equals two Landau level and so on. They're equally spaced, okay? If I increase the field, suppose I increase the field to, to, to let's say, I don't know, one and a half times this, right? So what will happen? Two things happen. First of all, omega C grows up, goes up, right? So these things are spaced further and further apart. So then this guy will come here. And then the height of this thing also increases because the degeneracy of a Landau level also grows with the magnetic field, okay? So that is what happens. So this is n equals zero of the yellow field. This is n equals one of the yellow field and so on. So this is what is happening. So you have some fixed number of particles in your system and you're sweeping the field. So something very complicated is going on. Okay, so typically you will have a certain number of Landau levels full and some Landau level partially full. That's what will typically happen. As you sweep the field, you know, all these things, the degeneracy will increase. And at some point you'll have just two, let's say land all of us exactly four. Okay, and then you increase the field a little bit more and then the degeneracy here goes up and here it goes up. So therefore this guy will become full, this guy will become slightly less than, and so on. Okay, some, some, some very complicated stuff happens. This was actually all worked out. The reason this is called Landau levels, it all worked out by Landau in the 1930s. Hey, there's something called that you do in statistical physics or somewhere called Landau diamagnetism. Have you guys done it? Only one person has done it. Landau diamagnetism. I think I should have a word with your StatMac teachers. Hey, this, is, this is something that you should know about. Something very basic. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Okay, now, we're gonna talk about disorder in detail in a little bit. I have 20 minutes, but first we're gonna talk about edges, but let me say what happens with disorder. So what will end up happening is that there will be localized states around the center of each Landau band. So in other words, the Landau level, which used to be a delta function now broadens out. Okay, into a bunch of states that are spread out over some finite energy range. And most of these states are localized, but there is one state in every Landau level that's extended. I'm gonna show that to you. Okay. That is the picture with this all, but, but let's, let's get to it in due course of time. First, we wanna talk about edges. Uh, we will, extended means, that the state has, one single state has support from one edge to the other edge. That's what I mean by extent. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, the spectrum is gauge independent. 
which one goes up and which one goes down? The degeneracy depends on the field, the strength of the field. Yeah, 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 yeah. But for different values of field, the heights will be different. The degeneracy will be different. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about edges. Okay, so at, at, at a real edge, what happens, so, so let's imagine that, that here's an edge. So this is already an edge, but this is the edge that I'm not supposed to go beyond. So what happens near the edge is, let's say this is the sample. So there are electrons here, and let's say this is vacuum here, okay? So these are electrons, right? So therefore the electric field must be pointing in this direction. So there must be some electric field here. So, there, so let's call this direction Y, okay? There must be some electric field there because the electrons always wanna go against the electric field, right? Because the, the force on the electron is minus QE. Huh? So the electric field is in this direction. There's also a magnetic field that I have decided is pointing into the blackboard, right? Because that's the minus Z direction, okay? So now I have the situation. So previously we had only an electric field, oh, sorry, only a magnetic field, and then the electrons classically would undergo cyclotron motion. Now I have an electric field and a magnetic field, both, and they're perpendicular to each other. You guys know about this problem? Have you guys done E and M with this problem? There's something called guiding center drift, okay, that happens. You have this. So if you have an electron here, right? And let's say the electron happens to be moving in the up direction at, at a given instant of time, then the magnetic field is that way, right? So there's a V cross B this way, but then the, uh, the charge is minus E. So the electron deep inside the sample, it would do this, a classical electron, right? It would simply undergo cyclotron motion. But now here, what would it do, okay? As it goes in the direction of the magnetic field, uh, sorry, the electric field, it would slow down, right? That's what the electron would do. So here's what it does. So it slows down. When it slows down, its cyclotron orbit decreases. When it speeds up, its cyclotron radius increases and so on. So it does this. Okay, so this is, this is how it's do, going. So overall, it's actually going in that direction. That is a semi-classical picture of what an electron does near a quantum hall edge. But I'm gonna give you a slightly better, better point of view, okay? So let's take, instead of this electric field, let's take a hard edge. So once again, I'm gonna go into this tube picture, right? But then I'm gonna put infinitely hard walls at the edges of the tube. So let's focus upon one edge of this tube. And then here's, here's how it looks. So this is V equals infinity. This is the edge. And let's say this position is L sub X. Okay. So now along here, I have all these guiding centers, right? Because L sub Y was finite. So there's, there are all these little guiding centers. So let's say this guy is J. So there's some X sub J, which is K L squared. K sub J L squared. Okay, very good. Now you go back to that Hamiltonian that's sitting there. So there's a harmonic potential that is centered at K L squared. Now, deep inside the sample, okay, supposing I'm at this guiding center, the electron feels some harmonic potential that looks like this, okay? And its wave function, if I'm in the lowest Landau level, is gonna do something like this, it doesn't even go to the edge, right? It doesn't feel that infinite potential. So here, the energy is gonna be the same as what was in the bulk. It's just gonna be N plus a half H bar omega. As the electron, as the guiding center approaches the edge, suppose I'm here, then you see it does this. And now this electron is experiencing a different potential. Obviously this potential has increased, so the energy must have increased, right? From its bulk value. How much? We don't know. You'll have to solve the differential equation to find out. But let's keep going. So let's say there is a guiding center right here at the very edge. There, the harmonic oscillator potential looks like this. 
Okay, it's half a harmonic oscillator and then there's infinity on the other side. That we know how to do. Do we know how to do this? How do we do this? Variational principle, says somebody. Okay, somebody else? I want an exact answer. Just take the odd wave functions. Odd wave functions are eigenstates, right? Okay, great. So we know, so here's now, let me draw this, this picture now. Okay, so this is L sub X. And now I'm gonna draw the energy as a function of guiding center, okay? So deep inside the bulb, the N equals zero Landau level is one half H bar omega C. And it remains like that, okay, and then there is, so let me actually draw it slightly better. So let's say this is one half h bar omega c, this is three halves h bar omega c, this is five halves h bar omega c. Okay, and this is seven halves, this is nine halves, this is the n equals zero, one, two, three, and four land level. Okay? All right, very good. So I claim that this guy should end up here because this n equals one Landau level is odd. It's an odd wave function. Okay, the odd n are odd wave functions. The even ends are even wave functions. So this guy should go here, okay? This guy should go here and so on. That's what should happen. Now, let me draw it like that. Now I've drawn these guiding centers over here. There is a guiding center here, right? What about this guy? That comes back to your question there. In a slightly different guise, okay? Does that guiding center even exist? How about this state here, which is, you know, the, the X sub J is sitting outside the sample. Can I have a wave function corresponding to that? Some part of the potential is definitely there because if I draw my potential here, it will look something like this and this, right? This is infinite, that is not infinite. So the wave function lives here. So even though the guiding center is here, the wave function actually lives inside the sample, but its energy is very high, okay? Good. So now let's imagine, so here's my, my, my spectrum, including the edge, okay. Now, let me, let me imagine that I have a system. Again, I'm forgetting about spin. So let me imagine that I have a system that in the bulk has two full Landau levels, okay? N equals zero and N equals one. And I draw my chemical potential somewhere here. And I ask myself, what do I see at the edge? Well, if I want to add a charge or remove a charge from the system through my contacts, okay? I have contacts around the edge. I want to add or remove a charge, I can do it at zero energy only at these points here. This guy and that guy. This guiding center is sitting outside the sample, but of course the wave function is still inside, right? In the, in the way that we just discussed. Okay, so now there are two points where the chemical potential intersects the spectrum, the filled part of the spectrum. So all this part will be full in the system. These guys will be occupied and those guys will be empty. So if I wanna add a charge, I can add it here and I can add it there. So any conduction that happens in a quantum Hall system happens only at the edges. So in the insulator, it's a, it's a, sorry, in the bulk, it's an insulator. At the edge, it's a conductor. So this is an example, one of the simplest examples of a very general phenomenon, which you probably heard of, at least the buzzword is topological insulator. So this is the world's first and simplest topological insulator. So it has, it's insulating the bulk. There's a gap to all charge excitations. Whereas at the edge, there are necessarily gapless charged excitations. All right, now somebody asked about thermal conductance. Yes, because these edges, they transport charge, they can also transport entropy. So there is thermal conductance 
on these edges. Yes, you are. It's very important to emphasize that yeah. the phrase deafness is what happens more than I'm hearing. Yes. Uh, of the NY, which is the yeah. Otherwise, yeah. there is a tiny gap. Yeah. Yeah. Did everybody understand what you all said? So there is, there is a spectrum here, right? And as long as LY is finite, there are these little guiding centers here, right? There's one here, there's one there, you know, one here, one here, one here, one there. So he's saying that there's some tiny gap here, but as you make LY bigger and bigger, this gap shrinks and the spectrum becomes continuous in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, this is true in a, in a, in a so-called metal as well, right? Because even in a metal, there are various, you know, there's a Fermi surface, and so on and so forth, but then the K are all discrete in a finite system. And so in order to properly define a Fermi surface, you need to go to the thermodynamic limit. Okay, good. Questions about the edge. So this is sort of the world's simplest edge. This was first discussed by Halperin, Bert Halperin in I think 1981 or 82 or, or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Very good, very good. So, so here's the issue. So if I put my chemical potential in, you know, in the bulk between let's say n equals one and n equals two, and then I ask how many states are contained, right? You will see that all these states, even though they exist, they're not filled, okay? So therefore the, the number of states, of course, the details of the edge will change the, the states by a few but they will not change it thermodynamically, okay? So even though these states are there, they're very high in energy, so they're not filled. So I'm counting only the filled guys, okay? Yes. Yeah. 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 No, because I'm taking periodic boundary conditions. I'm thinking of a tube. Okay, in a real system, of course, it will vanish. But typically what happens is that in, in all these, in the thermodynamic limit, I think Weil or somebody showed this in the, in the 1930s. In the thermodynamic limit, the density of states does not depend on the boundary condition. Okay, so the, the, the number of states per unit energy, there will be some small adjustments depending on the boundary condition, but the, the degeneracy will not depend on the boundary condition. In, in the thermodynamic limit. All right, other questions? Yeah. Sorry? Why did I call it gapless? Because as Y, LY goes to infinity, these states get closer and closer, right? And therefore I can add or remove a charge with arbitrarily low energy from the system. That is why it's gapless. Wait, you've had your quota of questions for now. Okay, so I want to finish the disorder. And then once I finish the disorder, then you ask your question. So remember it. All right, so now in the last five minutes or so, six minutes, let me talk about disorder. Yes. Very good, very, very good point. So, very good. So the analog of this semi-classical argument that I just gave you about why the thing moves along the edge, right? This E cross B drift, right? Guiding center drift. The, the analog of that here is the fact that this guy has some BE by DK. And this is a velocity in the Y direction because K is a momentum in the Y direction. Okay, so there's a velocity to these edge modes. These guys are called edge modes, okay? So they carry charge and they also carry entropy. They can carry heat. All right, so let's talk about disorder. So I'm gonna take a limit where B is very large. Okay, what do I mean by large? Large compared to what? Okay, what I mean is that this magnetic length is much, much smaller than 
the correlation length of the disorder. So the disorder has some scale over which it varies. Okay? I'm going to call that C disorder. Okay? Then I can think of the disorder as being very smooth. Okay, on the scale of L. So let me draw a, a, a particular picture. Okay, so let's say I have a minimum of the disorder. It looks like this. Right? I'm going to look at it from the top. Okay, if I look at it from the top, what I will see is that the electric field, so I, I draw it like that, right? The electric field is pointing inwards, right? Okay, now my electrons are doing guiding center drift, right? Previously, when there was no disorder, they were undergoing cyclotron motion. So let me think semi-classically, right? So what's gonna happen is that these electrons, an electron that's sitting here, will do something like, you know, something like that. So overall, the direction of rotation will be like this. And I'm using this fact by saying that this cyclotron orbit size is very tiny compared to the size of the potential itself. That's why I'm using this condition, okay? The size of each of these little squiggles is little l. The scale of variation of the disorder potential is that, which is this. Is this clear? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some kind of bohr sommerfeld quantization. So I'm gonna quantize this periodic motion. I'm gonna draw some orbits like this, okay? So let me draw this orbit here. There'll be another one here. There'll be another one here. And they will roughly follow the equal energy contours of this disorder potential, right? Because E cross B drift goes perpendicular to the electric field, which means it goes on an equal potential contour, okay? So it's going on these equal potential contours. So that's near a minimum. Okay, we all know that near a minimum, charges get localized. But in quantum Hall systems, something else happens. Supposing I now take a maximum, let me draw it here, use my space more efficiently. Supposing I draw a maximum like that, now my electric field is pointing outwards. However, guiding center drift still happens. And instead of going this way, the electrons simply go that way. They are still localized. So here's the funny thing about quantum Hall systems. Disorder localizes orbits both near minima and near maxima. Okay. So now let's think of a landscape. Now I'm going to ask you to imagine. Okay. There's some landscape. There are some, some holes. There are some big lakes. There are some hills. There are some mountain ranges. There's all kinds of stuff. Okay. Now I start filling the system with electrons. So first of all, they fill the, the bottoms of all the lakes, right? The deepest lakes get filled first. And then at that point, you can walk from one side to the other side of the sample, right? By foot, because there's a land bridge across the entire thing. The lakes are all isolated. Imagine that you fill it almost completely. Then you have a sea of electrons and there are some, some islands that are sticking out of the sea of electrons. Now you can take a boat, right? You can take a boat. You can't walk across, but you can take a boat. So at some point between when I can walk across and when I can take a boat across, there will be a critical point. That critical point is this state here, this extended state. Okay, so the states here are localized below the extended state, the state above are localized because they're localized around the maxima of the disorder potential as well. But the state right at that boundary, that interface between the states that are localized at minima and the states that are localized on maxima, that state is extended. So the picture is the following. As I shift my chemical potential, supposing I do something else than what I was saying earlier, okay? Supposing I keep the magnetic field the same, but I change my filling by changing the chemical potential. What will happen is all the way up to here, I will find that the system is completely localized. There will be no quantum Hall effect. As soon as I cross this extended state, there will be a quantum Hall effect, okay? And then it will continue all the way until I cross the next one. And then there'll be a different plateau. So the plateaus are the regions 
where the chemical potential is between extended states. Okay? And the plateau transition is when it crosses the extended state. And the reason the RXX, give me one more minute. The reason the RXX is zero is because RXX means there's dissipation. That means there must be some scattering at very low energies, okay? So that means there must be some extended states at very low energies for the electrons to go into. But when the chemical potential is sitting somewhere here, all the states that it sees are localized. So it can't st scatter into any extended state. So there's no possibility of dissipation. That is why RXX is zero on the plateaus of RXY, of, R, of the Hall resistance. Okay, this is why in order to have quantization at all, so if you, okay, let me, let me take a counter, counterfactual. Supposing there was no disorder at all, there would be no quantization of the Hall resistance. In fact, you would go back to that straight line picture. You can show this by relativistic invariance. Take that as a homework, okay? You can always go to a frame. So let's say your, 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 your charges are moving. You can go to a frame where that velocity is zero. And you can convince yourself that in fact, the, the Hall resistance should exactly follow that straight line. Okay, so it needs disorder in order to have the quantization of the Hall resistance. All right, I'm done. Now time for questions, more questions. So in different situations, they could be different. I mean, in the, there's some, you know, so, so in these gallium arsenide two decks, they put dopants somewhere far away from the, from the thing to reduce the disorder, but still they create some long range Coulomb potential. And that's why this, this, this C sub disorder is large. Yeah, the local electric field, exactly. Oh, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. But then, I mean, how do you really see this kind of, uh, like you're saying, okay, the, it connects through the system, but. Uh, no, the connection through the system is simply the interface between things that are localized around minima. As I change the energy. Okay. There'll be, I fill up the holes first, right? Right. The bottommost holes. Right. And there may be some, some hills inside the holes as well. Right. That's also possible. It doesn't matter. At some point, if I fill enough, I know that I will not be able to walk across. Okay. Uh, so there's okay. some kind of percolation transition right. going on, right. right? Right. It's at that critical point of the percolation transition that right. you find the extended state. Right. It's a very complicated state, okay? It's not, it's not a simple state. It depends on the realization of disorder. It's some multifractal, it's some, you know, some very complicated state, but it connects one edge to the other edge. Okay. So, and another question is, uh, so uh, in presence of an edge, uh, so you said that there are these uh, uh, velocities which you can have. Yes. Uh, so then, I mean, those are also states which are like kind of extended, right? Because these are kind of, I'm yes. going through the edge. Edge states are definitely extended. That is why you can have transport through the edge states. Right, right. Absolutely. They're extended. Not only are they extended, they cannot be localized by disorder. As long as the bulk state is intact, the edge states have to be intact. Okay, that's the topological property. Uh, okay, 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 thanks. That's few states which are uh, which are spread throughout the sample or which can go from one one edge into to on a, that is correct uh, that is so correct. Uh, does that number depend on the type of disorder you are add, adding in the sample typically there's only one state okay there's only one state now if you go to finite temperature so around this state so there's some some complicated stuff goes on okay so as you approach this energy here there's a certain size to all these localized states, okay? That's called the localization length. That localization length diverges as you approach that energy, okay? So at a finite temperature, what happens is there's some little window here of order KT, KBT, K Boltzmann times T, and those states can all scatter amongst each other because of the thermal bath. Okay, so that is why the plateau transition is broadened with temperature. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Yeah. That's true. No, 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 no. You, you have to be very careful. Extended state appears in the middle of the Landau band, the disorder broadened Landau band. Yeah, yeah, in the field, it connects to the edge. It's not identified with the edge. It certainly connects to the edge. But the point is that it connects from one end of the sample to another, but it's living at this energy. Now, let's say your chemical potential is here. Okay, when the chemical potential is here, the only states that are conducting in the sample are the edge states. There's nothing else. All edge conduction. There's no bulk conduction going on. It's, it's not sitting at the energy of the edge. Yeah, in, in, in a, in a non-interacting picture, there's a very strict division between the extended state, which sits in the middle of the Landau band, the edge states sit in between Landau bands. So majority of the time you put arbitrary chemical potential, it will not hit the extended state. It'll be edge conduction that happens. Yeah, you see it already in the quantum Hall plateau transition. Yeah, I do it, but then, then you always have sample and you have not the state. Yeah. I really cannot distinguish. No, no, the, 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 the threshold of the plateau transition is where the extended state lives. Below that, all states are localized, belonging to that Landau band, right? The disorder burn Landau band, all states are localized below that chemical potential. Above it, they connect to the edge, there is an edge state. Yeah, so why does this R Rxx uh, reach the level of uh, Rh at this at the transition? Rxx? Yeah, so R Rxx reach this uh, plateau, right? You you draw you were drawing this diagram, right? Where these delta function... That, that depends on the temperature and many things, okay? But look, the, the intrinsic scale of resistance in any quantum mechanical problem has to be H over E squared, right? There's no other scale. Okay, but uh, but the dissipation uh, R excess was happening because of the dissipation, and why it has to relate to H over E squared? Then, then my next question so, will so at, a, at a critical point. Think about so you're approaching some percolation transition, right? Some critical point. You think about you know what kinds of things can R excess depend on. So at a critical point, everything is scale invariant, right? There's no external scale. So now what you're going to do is you're going to relate Rxx to some number of order unity times a fundamental unit of resistance. There is only one fundamental unit of resistance in quantum mechanics, that's H over E squared. Okay. I think okay another comment. Oh about, my God, uh, okay. <laughs> about this uh, simple-minded uh, picture. Yes. Uh, ju just to avoid you're confusion. You're already saying simple-minded, you're already casting. Yeah. Aspersions on it. <laughs> uh, so, 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 we, we need to emphasize that even if you are away from this uh, uh, mid delocalized state, yeah. uh, conductance in this simple name and the picture, conductance will be quantized because of the edge at zero temperature. At zero temperature. At zero temperature. Yes. Will be a, will be quantized. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, uh, even even uh, at a at a finite temperature, yeah. Uh, I mean, depending on the energy scales, you will be uh, quantized. And actually, what you would expect from this naive picture is if you uh, 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 scan the entire plateau, yeah. Then at that particular point. Well, in addition to the edge channels, the, the, this delocalized bulk state joins in, yeah. in sort of a percolation uh, that's manner, that's the, then there, there, will be, there, will be, then the, there will be also, I mean, the, the two edges will start talking to each other, right. and you will have some uh, reflection. So that will be uh, a dip on the plateau because the, 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 the quality of the uh, quantization 
uh, will be undermined. Flip of what? Of, of RxY or RxX? Of RxY, of sigma RxY, XY. The plateau, that will be the edge of the plateau itself, right? That's where the plateau becomes not flat, but starts getting rounded. No, near, the, near the extender state. General, uh, you talked about Landau gaze, but in general, the A value we take, that is not unique, right? As long as you have this. You can choose any gauge you want. You just have a harder time solving the problem analytically. That's all. So, I mean, the, I mean, all this theory work and all, that should be dependent upon the gauge you take. No, I mean, let's take spectrum a... Spectrum is gauge independent. Spectrum is always gauge invariant. The wave functions are not. Mm, yeah. but the spectrum is gauge invariant. The degeneracy is gauge invariant. So, in, so let's say if I take another gaze instead yeah. of Landau gaze, what more information I get about the system and I just... You don't get any extra information. It depends on the geometry. If you take a disk geometry, you have to choose something called symmetric gauge. Okay. So, and there's a whole little section in, in the notes that I didn't get a chance to cover because we didn't have time, but read it. There's, there's, read it. So, <laughs> other questions? Okay. Let's All right. Of the